Welcome everybody to today's webinar. We are so happy to have you here. So today we are going to start with our ILTT webinar series, Intensive English Language Teacher Training, that is titled How to Teach English, English Successfully, Methodology and Tips. Welcome, dear teachers. Now we are going to start with today's session. So remember that you, have, uh, you can join us on Facebook when we are more than a thing, 18,000 members. Um, you can join us uh, to our WhatsApp too. Uh, so here we are more than 2,500 teachers. Um, on YouTube, you can subscribe here. Uh, we, we are more than 2,000 uh, members here, or you can, you can visit our Google site. So uh, today we have some, uh, some important instructions for you about the certificate of participation for uh, this webinar series. Uh, about the webinar resources and the attendance registration. Please uh, pay attention to these instructions, okay? I'm going, to, um, I'm going to give you these instructions in Spanish para que no quede ninguna duda. Vamos a ver, lo primero, eh, con respecto a la constancia de participación que se va a emitir por este nuevo ciclo de webinars. Antes de hablar de este tema, también quiero recordarles que eh, deben ingresar, acá tenemos el link y seguramente lo vamos a compartir también a través de nuestras redes, nuestro link de nuestro blog English Teachers in Peru, donde ustedes van a poder ingresa, ingresar, https dos puntos, doble slash sites.google.com slash view slash English Teachers in Perú. ¿Qué van a encontrar aquí? Es muy importante esta información para todos ustedes, teachers. Aquí van a encontrar la constancia de participación, la lista de docentes que están accediendo a la constancia de participación de nuestros webinars pasados. Recordemos que eh, este 2021 hemos emitido ya dos series de webinars. La primera que ha sido el seminar, uh, Summer Webinar Series y el segundo que es el Crash Webinar Series que hace aproximadamente un mes o algo más hemos terminado. Aquí van a poder encontrar eh, haciendo clic en cada imagen la lista de los docentes que están accediendo a la constancia de participación. Recuerden que la constancia de participación, eh, nosotros consideramos el total de las horas emitidas durante todo el ciclo de webinars. Se, se está considerando el mínimo de asistencia del 80%, tanto en el Summer Webinar como en el Crash Webinar. Eh, es decir, eh, aproximadamente equivale a 10 asistencias como mínimo y 11 asistencias como mínimo. Todos los teachers que han cumplido con esa solicitud que se les ha hecho eh, y han estado presentes y han registrado su asistencia correctamente están eh, en esta lista. Tienen que verificar sus nombres antes de que emitamos la constancia. Por eso la estamos compartiendo por nuestro blog. Deben de ingresar. Uh, al link que les acabo de enviar aquí, que está aquí, que lo pueden ver de nuestro blog y deben de hacer clic a la imagen que corresponda al ciclo de webinars en el que ustedes hayan participado. Una vez que ustedes lo hagan, les va a salir la lista de los docentes que acceden a la constancia. Verifican si se encuentra su nombre y si su nombre está digitado correctamente. Es importante que verifiquen eso porque así va a salir en la constancia. Y si hay algún error, porque a veces llenan el formulario y se equivocan o se les da una letra vocal. Entonces queremos evitar que eso suceda. Eh, si todo está ok, entonces no hay ningún problema. Nosotros durante la próxima semana, a partir del día miércoles, les damos desde hoy hasta el día miércoles para que verifiquen sus datos, 
con los datos que tenemos ahí ya validados, empezamos a hacer la emisión de sus constancias y van a ser enviadas a su correo electrónico. Si hubiera alguna observación y algún dato erróneo o alguna observación de algún docente que indique que si ha participado en la cantidad de webinars solicitado, etcétera, y no ve su nombre, lo que fuera, tienen ahí también el correo de nuestra comunidad, English Teachers in Peru, eh, a, arroba gmail.com, ¿no? Donde nos pueden escribir para que los podamos atender. Bien, esto con respecto a, la, a las constancias por las que nos han estado consultando, preguntando, nosotros les agradecemos de antemano su paciencia, recuerden que prácticamente nosotros verificamos la asistencia porque tenemos que sumar todas las horas y son más de 8000 datos por cada ciclo de webinar que se validan, entonces toma un poquito de tiempo. Mil gracias por su paciencia y recuerden que todo esto es completamente gratuito, no se ha solicitado ningún tipo de, de, de pago por, por estos eventos realizados por la comunidad y con mucho cariño de parte de todo el equipo administrativo. Bien, sobre este ciclo de webinars, nuestro IELTT Webinar Series, sobre este ciclo de webinars que es exclusivo con temas de eh, enseñanza de la metodología del inglés considerado sin eh, para su preparación incluso para dar exámenes de contrato, ascenso, nombramiento Mineu o quienes dan exámenes como el TKT para poder postular a una certificación de Cambridge de Cambridge, entonces eh, todos los, los webinars que se van a dar están enfocados eh, en este objetivo ¿no? para los teachers, para su preparación. El certificado de, pre, eh, de participación en este caso por este webinar va a ser de 32 horas eh, van a ser un total de 10 webinars y un conversatorio al final. Lo mínimo requerido para su constancia de participación son 8 webinars y participar en el último conversatorio, que es obligatorio, ¿no? The last panel discussion. Eh, webinar resources. Guest speakers will share their resources with you, teachers. Aquí eh, en cada ponencia, en cada webinar, se envía el material compartido, facilitado por los speakers eh, para fortalecer su preparación eh, por eventos, siempre y cuando hayan asistido. Y ahora hablamos de la asistencia, attendance registration, y además registren su asistencia. ¿Dónde lo van a hacer? En el exit ticket, que lo vamos a facilitar durante la transmisión. Your registration will provide you with access to webinar resources and certification of participation. Es importante que en cada webinar ustedes llenen el formulario del exit ticket, porque ahí registran ustedes sus datos, su correo y todo lo que nos va a poder permitir enviarles estos materiales, enviarles su constancia una vez concluido nuestro ciclo de webinars. Si tienen cualquier pregunta, pueden también hacerla llegar a cualquier administrador a través del messenger de nuestra página o a través de nuestro correo electrónico. Bien. Esta, al ser, por ser el primer webinar, es importante mencionar todos estos detalles. Ahora sí, iniciamos entonces. Now, uh, I'm going to share with you some directions that you, you need to consider to participate in this webinar, in today's webinar. So, first, please type your questions in the comments section. Remember that, please. The answers to your questions and comments will be replied by our guest speaker at the end of the webinar in the question time section. Remember that, please. During the live webinar, we will share a link for you to have access to the exit ticket, okay? The attendance registration, remember that, which will be available for 15 minutes only. Remember that, please. Okay. And now it's time to know our guest speaker. Please, uh, can you introduce our guest speaker, Miss Sulamita Chuten? Sure. Thank you, Miss Mariela Condorena. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sulamita Chuten, and it's a pleasure uh, and an honor for me to introduce our guest speaker for today's webinar. This is Manuel Salas. Uh, Mr. Salas has 
and ELT degree from the National Pedagogical Institute, Monterrico, Masters in Education Management and Doctorate Studies in Education at the Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos. Certificate of Proficiency in English of the University of Michigan and Certificate of MS Office Expert Specialist from Cybertech. Training in Coaching at PUCP, Diploma in Education Management at the Escuela de Directores of IPAI. More than 30 years experience in schools, academies, and universities as teacher, academic coordinator, and deputy headmaster. Ample experience as teacher trainer and ELT advisor, giving workshops throughout the country as a freelance consultant for Pearson, Macmillan, and Greenwich. In addition to educational projects, Mr. Salas has experience in designing virtual learning environments, latest experience as ELT specialist from elementary school at Minero. He's going to present us the webinar titled Teaching Grammar Effectively. During this webinar, we will review some concepts about the teaching of grammar, making a con contrast between what is called overt grammar teaching and covert grammar teaching. We will reinforce the concepts of grammar structure, meaning, use, and pattern. Welcome, uh, Mr. Salas. Thank you for accepting our invitation. The audience is all yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I'm really pleased to be one more time with you. And I hope that uh, my presentation will be useful. Let me share. I'd like to share my screen. You can share your screen, Guillermo Manuel. May I share it? Yeah, no, not yet. Let me see. Okay, here I go. All right, there you are. Okay, now you can see it. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, so yes, the title for this presentation is Teaching Grammar Effectively. And uh, it's very important to take into account uh, several ideas that um, lie behind any, any particular uh, approach, belief that you may have with respect to grammar. Uh, and uh, I'd like to begin by answering the question, what is grammar? And the first idea that comes to, to our mind is that grammar is a study and practice of the rules by which words change their forms and are combined into sentences, right? That is the first thing about grammar. This is grammar, okay, great. But now there are some grammatical terms that I like to refresh, okay? Terms like the sentence, okay? The clause. We must be conscious about the difference between a sentence and a clause. Another level is the phrase. Then we have the word. Okay. So you see, we're we are getting from the big to the small. Okay. 
till we get to the smallest unit of meaning that is a morpheme, right? But don't worry, we'll not talk about the morpheme now. That belongs to linguistics. But here is my first reflection. A sentence is a grammatical unit that is composed of one or more clauses. This is a very simple example. The book isn't necessary. Now, look at this. The book isn't necessary, but the workbook is obligatory. The first sentence is what we call a simple sentence. What do you call the second example? Can anybody tell me? I like to check your answers on Facebook. By the way, I don't have the link yet. Let me see. I don't have the link yet. Okay. Okay, great. Now I'm getting it. Excellent. Okay. So that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, right. You're very near, very near. It's a compound sentence. Yes, Jesus, Jesus Hilario got the, the, the first uh, answer. Okay, great. Yes, that's a compound sentence. Great. Okay. So now we may continue. Okay. Now look at this one. The book that they receive is unnecessary. Now, how do you classify the sentence? Can you tell me? Okay. I don't know if Francis, Francis Salva has just replied. But Francis Alva has the, the right answer. It's a complex sentence. Okay. Yes, my third example is a complex sentence. And what about this one? The book that they receive is necessary, but the workbook is obligatory. What do you call this now? Anybody? Come on. Just give me your opinion. What do you think? Okay, the last one is what we call a compound complex sentence, okay? So this is very important because when we want to teach, we need to have very clear in mind, very clear in mind, the complexity of the construction that we are planning to teach, to practice, to evaluate, okay? That's very, very important, all right? So at what level, at what level of construction are you working on? Are you working on simple sentences? compound sentences, complex sentences, or compound complex sentences, okay? You see? All right, so now let's continue. <clears throat> okay. 
Now, this is the definition of a clause. A clause is a grammatical unit that includes, at minimum, a predicate and an explicit or implied subject and expresses a proposition. Okay. Now, within within the um, within the the uh, complex example here, the complex sentence, we can find clauses, right? Like the book that they receive is unnecessary. The main clause is the book is unnecessary. But there is another clause, another clause that is they receive. They receive. Okay. And what do you call that clause? You know? Come on, make your comments. I'm reading your comments. Mm -hmm. It's a subordinate clause. Yes, it's a subordinate clause. Okay, so I can say I have two clauses here, right? Yes. If you look at the next example of the book that they receive is unnecessary, but the workbook is obligatory. There you have three clauses, two independent clauses and one subordinate clause. Okay. That is the way we that is the way we say it. Okay. All right. Great. Now let me go on. <clears throat> So here's the level of a phrase. Now, remember we uh, we start we started with the sentence, now the clause, and here we are at the level of the phrase now. So phrase is a syntactic structure that consists of more than one word, but lacks the subject predicate organization of a clause. Okay, examples. The new students. That's an example of a phrase. May I ask you what kind of phrase it is? I'd like to read your comments on the on the Facebook Live chat. In fact, I like to listen to you, but I can't. Just reading. All right. So the new students, the new students, what kind of phrase is that? The new students is a noun phrase. Okay. It's a noun phrase. All right. Now, if the new student is a noun phrase, yes, Mahu Basser gave the right answer here. Okay. Then we'll have been reading. We'll have been reading. What kind of phrase is that? Now. The first phrase is a noun phrase. The second phrase is a it's a verb phrase. Okay, it is a verb phrase. Next, another example of a phrase, quite eagerly. Quite eagerly. What kind of phrase is this? It's 
It's an adverbial phrase. In the library. Thank you, Adrian. Yes, Adrian is following. It's a noun phrase, a verb phrase. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Mabel, I'm afraid you are wrong. Okay, anyway, in the library. In the library is what kind of phrase? It is a prepositional phrase. It is a phrase beginning with a preposition, but at the same time, at the same time, we can say that in the library is an adverbial phrase because it is expressing the notion of place. And just like um, in the morning is another prepositional phrase, but it is expressing the notion of time. So we can say that in the morning is also an adverbial phrase. Okay? Yes? All right. Here we go. Now, the level of word. Well, we understand that word is a unit which is a constituent of the phrase. Yes? At the phrase level, we just saw. Okay? So we have words like new, like students, right? Read eagerly in the, okay? Different kinds of words, all right? And now let me, let me continue teasing you. New, new is an adjective, right? Students, I'm reading you. Now, Read, verb, of course, eagerly. Adverb, in. Preposition, the. A determiner, right? Okay, okay. Thank you, uh-huh, I can see, yeah, I'm reading. And a little, little, yes, and uh, rise again. Great, thank you, thank you for your participation. So, well, this was just a little introduction to what the grammar is, and more or less what we can find, okay, in terms of of grammar, okay. However, here comes the the question. I mean, we are talking about the role of grammar in language teaching. This is the big thing. And the question is, where does grammar fit in? Where does grammar fit in? Okay, because many people think, no, I mean, grammar is not necessary. Are you sure? I don't teach grammar. What? Well, so, in the abstract, the little summary that I sent about this uh, presentation, uh, I mentioned uh, the fact that the first and last time that the word grammar appeared in the name of some kind of method was the grammar translation method. And that was several decades ago. First time and last time. And since then, we've had, for example, the audiolingual method, the situational language teaching, communicative language teaching, content based instruction, and CLIL later, task based language teaching and competency-based language teaching through standards and the common European framework of reference, right? So it was very obvious that uh, with the grammar translation method, there was the uh, biggest emphasis on departing from the study of grammar. 
What about the, the audiolingual method? Yes, there was a grammar, of course. There was, there was grammar because the audiolingual method had the structural approach behind, okay? There was a strong emphasis on, on, on the linguistic aspect. And also it had basis on psychology, yes? And so with the other lingual method, which is very strong and it is so strong that many people still use it. And we all, get to use some of the techniques of the audiolingual method even now. So the insistence on, 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 the, on the patterns that have to be drilled and repeated and memorized was big. And then came the situational language teaching. Situational language teaching, when you departed from a situation at the restaurant, at the airport, etc., And then you started feeding all the grammar and vocabulary related to that situation, right? But again, we had a syllabus which orderly presented grammar. But then came the communicative language teaching or the communicative approach or the notional functional approach. Yes, which was the first name it was given, okay? In which the emphasis was on the functions, on the acts of speech, okay? And grammar was given a second place. But it's still, grammar is what you use to realize every act of speech, every function. So when you say, all right, I'm teaching with a communicative approach, so, this lesson is about inviting. And of course, with inviting, I have two more functions, accepting and rejecting. Okay, great, great. That's your lesson about. Good. The question is, how will you realize your function for inviting. How do you make an invitation, in other words? And then you start thinking about that in terms of grammar. How do you make an invitation? Okay, invite somebody to go to the movies. One way, would you like to go to the movies? Two, do you want to go to the movies? Three, shall we go to the movies? Four, why don't you go to the movies? Five, how about going to the movies? Etc. 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 So many ways, so much grammar that you can use in order to realize inviting. And in the same way, you will decide on what grammar you will use to realize acceptance and rejection. So grammar is there. Grammar is there all the time. It's just a, a matter of emphasizing. And this depends on your belief, on your approach. What do you believe in? That is the first question, okay? And then of course, um, 
if we are um, using some content-based uh, methodology, then, you know, content-based uh, started with the idea of, all right, uh, you know, I will um, um, use the context of um, a geography, okay? So uh, uh, my lesson today will be about, um, will be about, let's say, a Machu Picchu, Machu Picchu in Cusco, okay? So everything around this content, this geographical area. Or maybe on my lesson, for my lesson today, uh, I will use some history, some history. So I'll talk about the pyramids, etc. So I, I will uh, uh, prepare everything about that. Great, great. You're using content, but again, what kind of communicative acts of speech will you use? What kind of grammar will you use? Okay. But of course, later we have CLIL. Yes. Uh -huh. Content and language. Yes, integrated. So that uh, you, could, you could have something even better structure, right? It doesn't matter if it is task-based language teaching, because when you use task-based, your focus is on the task, okay? On the project. Well, all right, so, you know, uh, you will prepare, uh, you will prepare uh, some uh, PowerPoint in order to give an explanation about uh, some disease, okay? Maybe uh, you will, you will, um, you will uh, uh, explain what COVID-19 is about, okay? So this is, you know, task, okay? And, and different groups will prepare, you know, different things, okay? maybe handouts besides the PowerPoint, okay? Maybe they will bring different kinds of elements to working class, etc. okay? And at present, we are focusing on some competency-based language teaching, right? Now everybody is focusing on this, competency-based language teaching, the standards, which of course fall under the umbrella of the common European framework of reference. Still, we're talking about can-dos, what your students can do. What can they do by the end of this class? Okay. However, again, the two pillars in terms of communication and linguistics, they have to be competent. We, we were talking about communicative competence and linguistic competence. Communicative competence in terms of what they do with the language. They will greet, invite, accept, reject, accuse, etc. And linguistically competent. What kind of grammar they are able to use in order to realize the communicative act. That's it. All right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's continue. 
Now, we are here at the presentation stage then, because uh, if we're talking today about grammar, well, we will just uh, talk about how we present grammar, okay? So what about the presentation stage? What, what's the presentation stage, right? It is a stage of the lesson at which students are introduced to the form, meaning use of a new piece of language students need to get an idea of how the new language is used by native speakers. And the best way of doing this is to present language in context, right? That is the, the key. We need context for presentation. All right. So to convey the form of the new language, as well as the meaning and use, the teacher will have to introduce the language, the students within the wrap of a context or situation, the body of information, which causes language to be used. What kind of context can we use? Can we present? Well, we can think about the student's world. Yes, the interests, etc. We can talk about the outside world. Yes, the outside world. That is, we bring information for students, or we ask from uh, students to get information that may be out of their reach at the moment, but they need to do some research. Okay. And formulated information. Okay. something that we prepare specially for this class. Okay, great. Here, um, I had several comments some time ago and uh, it's been uh, always, it's been always on, on the fashion, right in the air, like, uh, uh, for example, the idea of uh, using the information about Peru, 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 Peru. No, just use information about their, their original place. Their district, their province, their city. Well, there is a student's world, but what about the outside world? Remember that English is the window to the world. Why do you study English? Why do you teach English? It's for students to get to know the world, not to get to know your city. They know their city. Okay, so of course, it may be safe to use their information, but it is our obligation to let them know the outside world. All right, but that's always a debate. That's always a debate, <laughs> right? A debate in so much that some people are uh, say why 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 information from this united states or from great britain or you know etc that's silly that's silly we learn english because we want to be citizens of the world okay now what about the characteristics of a good presentation. Something to keep in mind. 
your presentation should be clear. That is, students should have no difficulty in understanding the situation or what the new language means. Clear, always clear. But as well as being clear, your presentation should be efficient. Efficient, yes? That is, the aim is to get to the personalization stage as soon as the students can manipulate the new language. You need to, to close the circle. If your students cannot use it, cannot get to master the piece of grammar that you're introducing, that you're presenting in your lesson, then it was not efficient. But also your presentation should be lively and interesting. Okay, with the help of a good situation and lively teaching, this stage can be the most memorable part of a lesson. And this is a term that we always, always use, memorable. For one way or another, for one reason or another, your presentation should be memorable. So memorable that after years, years, your students could remember your class. After they leave school, after they graduate, they will say, hey, do you remember our English teacher? You know, yeah, you don't remember that time, that class when he did this, etc. Memorable. Got to make it memorable. That is a key word. And it gets to be memorable if your presentation is lively and interesting. But there's more. It should be appropriate. Yes, appropriate. The presentation should be appropriate for the language that is being presented. It should be a, a good vehicle for the presentation of meaning and use. productive a situation the teacher introduces should allow students to make many sentences and questions with a new language that is productive if your students can produce can not only a, a, a repeat but also produce something of their own, of their own, okay? So if you make sure that, you're that, that you are giving your students the chance to produce, to produce, then your lesson and your presentation of grammar was Productive. Okay. I am reading a, I am reading a question here on the chat. Whether uh, is it, uh, when we, or what, what's better, American English or British English? Well, let me tell you that that is really, really old fashioned. Old fashioned. Now, we talk about teaching English for for international communication. English for international communication. That is a fashion. Only, only those institutions which are binational, binational institutions, like the Peruvian North American Institute, like the British uh, Institute, okay? Or maybe some schools which are American schools, real American schools, like in Lima, we have the, for example, Abraham Lincoln, North American, Peruvian North American school. Yes, or maybe the Roosevelt school. They can claim that they, they teach 
American English, and that's it. Or maybe British English, right? We have also British schools in Lima. Okay, so binational institutions can claim that they teach either American or British English, not to mention the two options. But then the, the rest of us in the world, we teach English for international communication. Okay, well, all right. Now let's continue with the types of presentation. Okay, what types of presentation can you can you use? Well, maybe using visuals for situations. That's absolutely important. Visuals, visuals. And that's something that, I mean, many people, many people are rather visual than, than, than linguistic. And I'm talking about, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the, the different kinds of intelligence that's right different kinds of intelligence so some people have visual intelligence other people have linguistic intelligence no they prefer to read yes etc to read to see the diagram to see the picture etc different ways okay using a dialogue right using a dialogue that's another way to present grammar we're talking about grammar, okay? And uh, if we hey, if we use a dialogue, then then we have to pay close attention to the difference between written grammar and spoken grammar. One thing is written grammar, and something different is spoken grammar. How come? Definitely. When we talk about written grammar, we're talking about grammar that is rather formal. The grammar that we use when we write, when we write a letter. When do you write? When do you write? You write a letter, you write a report, you write an article. What do you write? But the spoken grammar is different. If you use a dialogue, then you can create different links between person A and person B, you can uh, present, for example, uh, if clauses divided into two parts. Because the first part may correspond to the first person, person A. Person A will say, uh, for example, uh, I think I'm going to the beach tomorrow. Okay. And the second person, person B in the dialogue may say, well, if the weather is nice. So in this way, you have if clauses, okay, in two parts, if clauses, where one clause is said by one person and another clause is said by another person. You see? And the same, the same may happen with uh, subordinate clauses. Subordinate clauses may occur in a dialogue, in the dialogue naturally broken. Like when you say, uh, I will have to write a report for my boss tonight. And the other person answers, which will be very difficult. 
you see? So that's a subordinate clause for the first part. You understand? You see? So this is because that is the way grammar occurs in spoken English. That is a spoken grammar, different from written grammar. All right, let's continue. But we can also use, of course, reading texts. Reading texts, which will be written grammar, right? That's a different thing. What do you present in reading texts? What kind of text? Well, you present an article from a magazine, you present an article from a newspaper, you present uh, a letter, different things, which is written grammar, all right? Great. But grammar may also be presented through using listening texts. Of course, through using listening texts. I uh, many times use songs, not specifically dialogues or interviews, but I prefer to choose songs. So I, I, I just introduce the song like, uh, I mean, I, I talk about my favorite uh, a singer or, or, or group. And then I saw, yeah, by the way, I have this song that I like you to listen to. And I play it. And I play it. Just play it. And I say, okay, so did you like it? So students say, well, yeah, well, I uh, didn't understand very well, but no? Oh, well, all right. Maybe you, maybe you didn't understand this section, this uh, sentence that they said, and then I presented it. I presented that about it. So I present, uh, for example, uh, maybe uh, uh, like, uh, no, I don't know, like person perfect or whatever, okay? Not the, this uh, line, okay, of the song, and I say, okay, now, I like you to listen to the song again, okay? And the moment, the moment you listen to this, raise your hand. Are you ready? Okay. Now they are listening. They are not reading the words. They are not reading the words to the song. They are just listening. So they have to pay close attention to that structure, to the grammar that I am presenting. Okay. So they listen carefully and say, all right. So they raise their hand and I stop, rewind, say, okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yes. This is the line of the song where he or they are using this, this formula. I always use the word formula. Great. Okay, excellent. And you, you know that songs are repetitive. So it's a good idea to use songs for this fashion, right? Of using listening texts, okay? etc. And then I depart, I depart from that. Okay. Then I can use, of course, a mini story situation. A mini story situation, which may be combined with pictures that's also very, very useful, okay? In order to make presentations. So five different types of presentation that uh, can help you, okay? Have you used them all? Maybe you have a favorite one. Well, my recommendation is to use a different type of presentation every time you have a class, different classes, different presentations. You know, variety is absolutely important, right? Absolutely important. Okay, let's continue. 
And now we get to this point to talk about covert, covert grammar teaching versus overt grammar teaching. Okay, so what is covert? Covert, what do you, what, what do you mean by, by covert? Well, grammatical facts are hidden and attention is paid to the activity or text, not the grammar. Whereas overt grammar teaching is when grammatical rules and explanations are provided. Okay, so if you, uh, for example, uh, let's say in a, maybe in a beginner class, right? Yes, it's a class for beginners. Maybe you, uh, you're presenting articles uh, on, okay? You want your students to, to realize about that. Well, first of all, you're just presenting sentences yes it's a dialogue whatever yes any of 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 these uh, presentations right and then and then you say okay now let's uh let's identify all the let's say for example uh, depending on the type of nouns that you have presented you don't say all the nouns no you say all the animals in this uh this text okay for example or okay let's identify all the fruits all the fruits in this text no or in this dialogue whatever no the i again i repeat you can use any type of presentation maybe a text a dialogue whatever okay but you ask them to pay attention to first the nouns but you don't say nouns Please, <laughs> well, I, I don't, I don't use, I never use grammatical terms in my class. I never use grammatical terms in my class. Okay, so I say, all right, now pay attention to all the animals. Okay, pay attention to all the fruits. Okay, and then I say, all right, now, um, I go to the board, yes, and then I write, I write my first uh, uh, fruit, let's say, banana, okay? And then uh, I can uh, trace a line, vertical line, and then write orange, okay? On the right, yes. And then I say, all right, banana. Banana is starting with a consonant, or a vowel, and the word will say, oh, a consonant, right. And what about orange? Oh, it's beginning with a vowel, or it's a vowel tissue, so, okay, a vowel, great. So can you please write all the fruits beginning with a consonant here under banana, and here you write all the fruits beginning with a vowel below orange, please. Okay, yeah, great. So. No, they will come to the board and write because I need my students to stand up and, 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 and move around, okay? Especially to please my students who have this kinesthetic intelligence. They need to move, they need to stand up. So I, I have to make my students move. I always make my students move stand up and come to the board and write and do anything. Okay, so um, so they go and complete, right? So maybe the fruits, the occupations or the the uh, the animals, whatever you have you have created, invented for your students, right? Okay. So after that, we will say now, Which word appears before banana? A or an? 
and everybody will read and say, uh, okay, it's ah, uh, that's right. That's right. Ah, uh, a uh, banana, we say a uh, banana. So before orange, what can you see? Oh, and teacher, and that's right. So now you can see the difference. Okay, we say a uh, banana a watermelon, etc., etc. Okay? And and you do the same with an. Okay? So that is the way, th this is what we call covert. Okay? Because we, I mean, everything is there, students don't see it, and then they discover it, right? They, or uncover, uncover. Okay? And it will be the same for anything. If you're teaching past tense, for example, the first time you teach past tense, you present the text in past, or you present the, your dialogue in past, you present your story in past. Okay? And then they will discover that the verbs change their form to express past and they will discover that there are two groups of verbs regular verbs and irregular verbs that is covered grammar teaching and that is the best option because your students will remember because of the discovery A different story is when you teach grammar overtly. Overtly means that you just go to the board and say, well, all right, today you will learn the past tense. Look, this is a sentence in the past tense. You can see the verb. You can see that in, in past tense, we have two groups of verbs, regular verbs and regular verbs, regular verbs, uh, you know, have ed, uh, et cetera. So you start explaining explaining the grammar that is teaching grammar overtly and personally I prefer overt uh, excuse me covertly I prefer my students to discover grammar however we can also you, we can also keep in mind that depending on the levels, depending on the levels, beginner, intermediate, advanced, our students uh, need more grammar explanation, more overt grammar teaching as they, as they get more advanced. Right? At the beginning, it is better to make it covertly. Okay? That is a tendency. All right. But anyway, one more time, I must, I must remind you of learning styles and teaching styles. That is, we cannot insist on using some teaching style just because we like it, just because it's my style, just because, it, no, because there must be a matching. We have to be careful to match our teaching style with the student's learning style. And that's why we have to use a variety a variety of presentations, okay? So as to match our students' different intelligences, multiple intelligences is a topic that everybody should be aware of. Okay, now there are some procedures for presentation. You can have a lead-in, you can use elicitation, 
yes, elicitation that is extracting, extracting, extracting information from your students, building up, building up the concepts, okay? You could use the explanation directly, right? And you can have accurate reproduction of the structure that you're presenting. But then you should have immediate creativity. Okay? Because this is the level at which everybody should get the production, the creativity. Okay? If your students cannot produce, create something, then your job is not complete. They may be doing something mechanical, some reproduction only, and that is not, uh, that is not the, the, the end of your job. Okay? All right. So we're talking about the contexts, different contexts, different kinds of contexts, the presentation, different ways to make our presentations, uh, the procedures for the presentation. And now, and now the clash between the form and the use. How come? What happened? Well, the first thing that we do when we make a decision about teaching grammar is think about the form, the structure. For example, the present continuous tense. Okay. Well, fine. I will teach the present continuous. This is what they need. Okay. And I have a situation ready to teach them the present continuous. Really? An example of the present continuous is he's running. Okay. He's running. Now, look at number one. He's meeting her at two o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Look at number two. Imagine the scene exactly one year ago. It's two o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon. I'm standing near the old factory. And look at number three. He's always complaining. There is a difference between one and two, between two and three, between one and three. I mean, they are different. Different what? Different uses. In number one, you are using the present continuous tense to express, to express future, right? Future, he's meeting her at two o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Future, look at number two. What are you using the present continuous tense for? In number two, you are expressing the past. That's right. It's very specific. Imagine the scene 
exactly one year ago. One year ago, that is past. It's two o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon. You are, you are appealing the imagination of the reader. I'm standing near the old factory. And the workers are coming out for lunch, etc., etc. You may continue using the present continuous tense in order to, in order to express past. And in number three, in number three. He's always complaining. He's always complaining. What are you talking about? What are you using the present continuous tense for? We are using it to express some habitual action. He has this bad habit of complaining all the time. You see, he's always complaining, all right? So, different, different uses. So you have to, when you think about grammar, what are you going to teach? Oh, I'm going to teach the present continuous tense. Really? And uh, what use? What? use of the present continuous tense. One, two, three, any other idea that you have? What use, okay? Very important, keep it in mind. All right, next. Okay, well, let me, I'm reading the comments here. Uh huh. Okay. Great. Good comments. Now let me continue, please. So, the use is the communicative meaning. Okay, there is a use, the communicative meaning, for example, future. Okay. Remember that in English, we only have two tenses, present and past, present and past. There is no future in English. Is the aspect, the aspect is different. Okay, so use. Communicative meaning, future. All right, great. Look at number one. I'll see her tomorrow. Okay, so we have to use will in order to express future. Yes. But Number two, I'll be seeing her tomorrow. That is also future. Okay, that is also future. I'll be seeing her tomorrow. But there is a third way. I'm seeing her tomorrow. That's future, of course. And what about number four? I'm going to see her tomorrow. Okay, so we have four ways to express future. Heller, Heller Corali. Yes, number two is the future continuous. Okay, great. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, okay, 
Yarid, Yarid Hernandez. Yeah, there is no future. Okay, uh, well, well, it's a, <laughs> what I mean, what I mean is that the present tense, you take the verb, for example, run, and we say, he runs. Okay, that's present. And in the past, you take the verb, you take the verb and you say, he ran. Okay. But for the future, what do you do? There is no future. In order to express future, you need to paraphrase, paraphrase, okay? You need the help of additional words, additional to the verb. So that's why in number one, we use will additionally. I will see her tomorrow. In number two, we are using two words additionally, will be, I will be seeing, right, etc. That's what I mean when I say there is no future in English, okay? It is not like Spanish, for example, or French. In Spanish, we have present, past, future, yes? Yo voy boy. Yo fui. Fui. Yo iré. Iré. Boy. Fui. Iré. Present, past, future. Okay? The verb is inflected. Inflected three times. But not in English. In English, there's only go, went. That's all, present and past, okay? All right. Well, but that, that's, uh, that is pure grammar and linguistics in fact, okay? All right, so let, let's continue looking at our examples of the use of the of this structure, of the form, okay? Let's see, in this case, we are looking at different forms for the same use. You see, we're going vice versa, vice versa. So we're looking at four forms to express future, but there may be a fifth form. I am to see her tomorrow, okay? Or simply, I see her tomorrow. You see? Six different ways to express the same communicative meaning, the same use, future, okay? With six different forms, all right? Hope this is clear. You following me? Okay, next. So, meaning and use. Let's see. We have this form, the present continuous, okay? And we can think, we can think of one of the uses, one of the uses for the present continuous. For example, this one. Describing a present action, okay? Describing a present action. And you can see the realization. I am opening the window. I am opening the window. Great, okay. Now, the next step for you to teach this form and this use is to think about a context, 
in context. Okay. For example, a cookery demonstration. Yes. When do you use? When? When? On what opportunities? When do you use the present continuous form to describe a present action? Use. Well, when, uh, when I make a cookery demonstration, good, that is your context. Okay? So now everything has sense. Okay, so a person like uh, Miss Plevisani, uh, do you know Miss Plevisani and her program Dulce Secretos? I love that program. Okay, so she may, she has this uh, cooker demonstration, and when she speaks, she, she says, and now look, I am mixing the flour and the water now. You see? So at, only at that moment, you have the language in action. In action. The real thing. The real thing. So you don't present, you don't present Okay, uh, today you will learn the present continuous. Look, we have a subject, okay? We have the auxiliary verb to be, and we have a verb with ing, okay? Now, oh, please, no, don't do that, okay? Or maybe you give one step forward. You say, look, today we will learn the present continuous. We use the present continuous to describe a present action, an action happening at the moment that we are speaking. For example, I am opening the window. Wait a minute. Do you go in your life describing what you're doing. Look, I am arriving. Look, I am speaking now. Look, I am having lunch. No, that is absolutely unnatural. So when, when do you have a chance to use the present continuous to describe an action happening at the moment of speaking. Well, maybe when you make a demonstration, for example, a cookery demonstration, all right? So you present, you present Ms. Plevisani, your video, okay, right? preparing some dessert, her usual desserts. And you say, okay, look, look at this video, please. And now, first of all, make a list, make a list of all the ingredients that Miss Plevisan is using. Ready? Come on, come on. Use your dictionaries. Great, so everybody just look. They are not listening, of course, because Miss Plevisan speaks in Spanish. Yes, unless, of course, unless you get a video <clears throat> which on YouTube, of course, on, on YouTube, you can find a video for some cookery demonstration. There's no problem. But I love Miss Plevisani. So you present that and, and you make your students view only or view and listen. See, okay, now take notes of all the, uh, the ingredients, first of all. Okay, great. So they make notes. They have all the ingredients. Excellent. First step, vocabulary. Okay, now, now pay attention to the procedure, okay? Listen carefully, pay attention to the procedure. What is she doing? What, what 
the demonstration. She said, okay, great. So then everybody's just uh, pay attention to the demonstration, to the procedure, the action, okay? That's it. Yes? All right. And then you can give them some handouts, yes? Or on your PowerPoint, you can present the different the, the procedure, see, in different order, in different order, right? So you can say, okay, now please put the procedure in order, in the correct order, come on. And they will just read, remember the, the video and put everything in order, great. All right, now please check, check with your partner. Okay, do you have the same procedure? They check, all right, yes, now they compare. Great, and then you present the correct order. Aha, uh -huh. now please everybody check in your papers. Then you, you present on your PowerPoint or whatever. Yes, or maybe you call the students to go to the board and they move around and do it, moving, writing. And then they listen again, they view the video again, and they check. You see, oh yeah, that's right, great, yes. That's what I heard, that's what I read, that's what I heard. So they're matching. Great. So this is the way, this is the way. Now, are you explaining? Are you using some grammar explanation? No. No, you are teaching inductively, inductively, not deductively. Not deductively. You are not, you are not teaching the rule. Okay. All right. Okay. I don't know if you have any questions so far. Let me see the comments here. Oh no, you're talking about the attendance. This question is about the attendance. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Veronica. Veronica Bustamante, okay. Uh -huh. Eli Miranda, thank you. Okay, Julie, Julia Romero is also with us. Charles, see. Uh -huh. Right, learners discover the rules. That's right. Okay, great, great. Yes, I mean, up up to this point, you know, I'm giving you, I'm giving you uh, an example of how I I do my class, how I do my class. Okay, and following, and following. Well, it's just a. Uh, I may continue with with more examples, uh, more examples. I mean, a second example, a second example of a procedure. Okay, maybe this was how to prepare a cake. Then I can give them another procedure. Okay, how to prepare, how to prepare, I don't know, lomo saltado, uh, some fricassee, okay? How to prepare ceviche simple something simple how to prepare ceviche okay you see and i will appeal i will appeal to their knowledge of the preparation of ceviche okay right anyway they will discuss and compare again etc etc right yes and then i will ask them to produce to produce uh, the preparation of anything they like. Maybe a sandwich. That's all. How do you prepare a hamburger? Okay. Right. So prepare your demonstration. Remember, this is a demonstration. Okay. So they will, the idea in the context is that they will, they will have to be the host or hostess in a TV program. Okay. So the TV program will begin in five minutes, etc. Okay, so all right. Are you ready? Lights, 
camera, action. Action, okay, and there must be a cameraman or a camera woman, yes, etc. Somebody working with the lights, yes. You have to keep your series busy, no? especially those rascals <laughs> who cannot be seated. No? Cannot be seated. You have to think about it. Okay. No. So instead of being interrupting, he will be just holding the camera. Okay, that's it. Or directing the lights. Right. It's a make believe. Of course, it's a make believe. All right, so, and you call them to the front and they start. All right, I, this is this is ceviche. Look, please pay attention to my demonstration. Now, I am chopping the, I don't know, the onions. Okay, now I'm putting the fish in the bowl. Now look, I am etc. 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 Okay, great. Yes. You may ask, hey, that's only I am, I am, I am. What about he or she? What's the matter? When do they have a chance to say he or she? That's easy. Yes, that's easy. Because you can think about the situation of the reporter. The reporter, yes, the reporter, just reporting, reporting live, live, live from the studio. We say, okay, now, uh, look, now Miss, uh, now Miss Paris is cutting the onions and, okay, now, look, now, now she's uh, slicing the fish. And she's putting the fish in a bowl. Yes, etc. etc. So it depends on your creativity. On your creativity. Okay. So then you can play another video, a short video, so that everybody can write the description of what they see, the description of the demonstration. Okay. Yes. This is what I see. Okay, so, all right. So the chef is chopping the vegetables now. Okay, yeah, great. So now the chef is, etc. Okay, he's doing this, he's, all right. So it's just a matter of creativity and that is our job. That is our job. Yes, the first thing, first characteristic of a, of a teacher is creativity. Well, all right, all right, I'm talking too much. This is the, this is the problem of the online uh, meetings, I mean, the webinars. It's just one way, one way uh, speaking. I cannot listen to you. I'm reading comments, of course, but I don't feel quite happy. I prefer live sessions in person, face to face, when I can move and make you move, make you speak at the moment. I wanna see you, I wanna listen to you. I hope to, to, to see you in person some, someday. Yeah? Someday, okay. Oh, by the way, before I continue, before I forget, I am uh, <clears throat> I am designing a, a two courses. One course uh, about pronunciation, okay, pronunciation, phonetics of English, and uh, and another course for uh, international exams preparation. In this case, FCE, FCE or English first, the fir first uh, B two, you know, level is the the minimum level that, of course any teacher should have all right so uh, i will be opening a group okay if you are interested just uh, email me email me you will you will read my email at the end of this presentation and let me know that you are interested and that's all and uh, i'll get in touch 
All right. So let's continue. For use, we talked about the context, but there is something else. Yes, yeah, something else. The pattern. Sometimes you have to choose a pattern. Check this out. First, you think about the general, the general big thing. The present perfect, that's on your mind. That's your syllable. It's on your syllables, maybe. It's on your syllables, okay? So we say, miss, it is September. In September, you have to teach the present perfect. Don't forget. You say, okay, the present perfect. Well, right. Now, uh, the present perfect has several uses. Yes. One of the uses for the present perfect is an action which is started in the past, but which still continues. Yes, that's one. We have several, several uses, right? For the present perfect. Be careful, please be careful. All right. So you choose this, this use, an action which is started in the past, but which is still continues. Great. Great. And then you look for the context, right? You look for the context in which this form and use will come up, will appear. All right? That's your creativity. That's your job. But when you think about the present perfect form and an action which is started in the past, but which is still continues, the use. You come to this. He has lived here for seven years. But you also, you also get across with this. He has studied French since 2019. Make a decision now. A decision about the pattern. So in this lesson, today or tomorrow, what pattern will you focus? The pattern that makes use of for, like for seven years, the time spent duration or will you choose the second pattern since since 2019 since he graduated from the university etc cetera, etc cetera. there are different alternatives for or since for or since what pattern will you choose, okay? So this is something else to keep in mind, all right? So that you can, so that you can uh, uh, have some graduation and scope, okay? For your grammar presentation, all right? So you may prepare one lesson one day, how many minutes, how many minutes do we have to present this? Huh? So, don't you think that uh, you may devote one day for one pattern and another day, another class for another pattern? Maybe it's a good idea. Okay, well, depending on your students, every class is different, right? So maybe you consider that your students are smart enough to be taught both patterns in one class. Well, all right, it's your decision. But anyway, it is something to think about, okay? 
when it comes to making decisions. All right? So the form, the use, and the pattern. All right? Okay. Now, I'd like to know if you have any questions so far. I have one minute to go. Come on, let me read, let me read the comments here. Sarah, Sarah Polar, both of them are correct, of course. Now we, we are not talking about correction, we are talking about opportunity of presentation. So which would you like to, to present one day and which on the next day, you know, that's all. I'm just calling, I'm, I'm, I'm calling your attention to this, you know, the fact that you make decisions about the form, the use, and the pattern. Okay, that's it. Well, all right. My dear colleagues, I really thank you very much for your kind attention. This has been a very brief, short presentation about the importance of grammar, okay? And how you can teach grammar effectively. If you have any, any question, consultation, don't forget to email me. That's my email. You can get in touch with me at any time. And uh, if you're interested in one of the courses that I am proposing, pronunciation or preparation for the FC beginning in September, just uh, let me know. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Questions now. Yes, thank you so much for this amazing presentation, dear Manuel. Now we have some questions for you. Please, can you help, help me with the questions, dear Angela Salazar? Sure, sure. Good evening. And Thank Hello, you so Angela. much for, for your presentation. It was really, really interesting. I think that all the teachers are more than more than excited with all what you show us today. And um, I have some questions here from the first one from Ms. Raisa Gio. Uh, she asked, how can we make a grammar fun and easy for kids? Fun and easy for kids. Well, first of all, if we're talking about kids, uh, I choose to use covert grammar teaching. That is, I never use grammatical terms, first of all, like noun, this is a noun, this is the adjective. This, no, never, never in my life. Okay, that is number one. And number two, you know, when you want to make things fun, you need to find the correct context. Yes, as I presented, as I showed different kinds of contexts, like uh, like stories, for example, stories work very good with, with uh, kids, okay? And, uh, and together with pictures, you know, we have big books, okay? Uh, publishers sell big books, but we can also prepare our own big books, okay? We can uh, use maybe a, 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 this big sheets of paper, Yes, that we can roll out so that we present our, our story. And this attracts the student's attention, sitting on the floor, of course, in a circle, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you make your voices and, and, and noises, et cetera. The sound effects, all right? This is one way that, that you use a fun, but you can also use songs, as I also mentioned, yes? I, I, I use uh, songs at all levels, well, the last years I've been teaching university students, university students and teachers at uh, San Marcos University, for example. But the, uh, the, the, the use of songs uh, is, of course, so special in the case of children. And, and let's not forget about jazz chants. Jazz chants, they work a lot well 
for children. Yes? Yes, yes. You have to use that beat. Yes? Yes? Like that. And everything should fall there. Okay? You did it. What did I do? You did it. What did I do? I told you that to do it and you did it again. You see? Everything falls out. Yeah? So that's, that is jazz chance. All right. And you invent. You have to create your own jazz chants so that they can uh, sing them all together in pairs. Yes? In, in two groups. I mean, in two groups. Yes? Right? and etc and so that, that's it and, and of course now we make use of, of videos lots of videos you know that uh, are on youtube that you can cut there are different um, uh, platforms and and useful tools in order to edit videos so you can capture some video and you edit it you edit it you cut here and there till you get your five minute your five minute video in order to use it and that's it so you can capture some some scenes from disney for example i love disney oh my god i love disney <laughs> so if, if you have i mean you see so many so many uh, uh movies so many movies that that disney has and you can just uh use those scenes short scenes from disney in order to present the language to your students and again language means grammar okay in all the terms that i have just explained yes another question thank you so much it was a lovely lovely answer and i i'm really thinking about how to change some things and i'm sure that all the teachers are in the same um mood so uh, i also have another question here from uh, miss liliana rodriguez she asks, uh, what is your opinion about can-do statements? The can-do statements, the can-do statements are the, the statements that uh, we have listed on the Common European Framework of reference. And uh, the, the can-do statements are, of course, a guide so that we can uh, have a, a, let's say, a, a a, a checklist of what our students are learning, okay? Of what we intend to teach and what our students make sure that they are learning, okay? The can-dos are absolutely important in order to demonstrate both students and parents I don't mention administrators because administrators are, are, I mean, the same as you. I mean, you know, you know what your business is, but students and parents need to be very conscious about what they are learning. Okay, so the can-dos are absolutely important for a demonstration. Yes, to keep track, I mean. Thank you so much. Um, I have another question here from Miss Ana Centeno Quispe. She asks, what's covered a teaching style or a strategy? That is a teaching style. It is a teaching style. When you, when you, when you uh, say uh, strategy, you can also call it strategy because a strategy is, is anything that you do in, in order to uh, get across some uh, activity and some response from your students, okay? But uh, I, I first think about the teaching style because that is the first thing that, uh, that you uh, decide or believe in, okay? So do you believe in explaining rules or do you believe in making students discover the rules. That's why I first think about uh, style. But of course, it is a strategy that you use anytime during your class because it's a matter of making decisions. 
okay, maybe on some opportunities, you will use covered grammar teaching and on some other opportunities, you will use overt grammar teaching because of the necessity, right? The kind of, of pattern, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I have another question. Um, what do you think about this? Like uh, now the books and many things have changed in the way uh, of teaching grammar, as you were saying. And what do you think about not showing the students like what is the form like after a, a big um, part of your lesson? I mean, uh, they show more the examples, how to use it, how to, how it's going to work. And after all of that, you show your, um, the form or the structure of the grammar that you're going to present. So what do you think about it? Or do you think it should be done like otherwise as it was used to be done, like, let's say in the past? <laughs> <laughs> know, okay, Angela. <laughs> Yes, no, uh, well, in fact, this, uh, uh, this webinar has been a reflection about that, right? About that, about uh, uh, maybe uh, finding the, the sense, no? The sense, the sense. Why? Why is it good to start by uh, using covered grammar teaching, like making students discover, I mean, to first, first of all, to expose, to expose the students to the uh, language, to different samples of language, yes? Because remember that we always teach purposefully. There is a purpose for everything we do, right? We don't uh, just uh, start uh, speaking or showing texts because because they are there. No, no, we, we, we teach with a purpose in mind. Everything we do, every joke we make. So uh, uh, that is the idea. That is the idea to expose our students, first of all, to make them identify, second step, yes, to make them reproduce, third step, and to make them produce, create, fourth step. All of this is about grammar but this is just within what communication is because that's something different i mean i'm talking only about grammar but uh it, something else is to do it communicatively that is and this is this is what we call the context right the context is 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 another story, right? That's right. Okay, Thank so you so it. much once again. And I'm sure that the teachers are going to use everything that you have shown us today. And once again, I want to invite you to stay with us for a little bit sure, longer. Sure. And it's always a pleasure to have you here in our community. Okay, Angela, yeah. I'll be here. I'll be here. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much again, dear Manuel. Now let's see what we have for the next weekend. Kurt, can you help me with this information, please? Hello? Sure. Yeah, okay. Continue. Yeah. Sorry. Oh uh, yeah, we have the information here. After that, we are going to continue with the exit ticket. Uh, continue, please, uh, Court. Thank you, Mary. You can miss next webinar. It's gonna be on Saturday, August 28th. And we are gonna have the presence of Michael Navarro. Michael is a passionate language teacher and a teacher trainer who is constantly looking for ways to enhance his teaching skills. He has taken different methodology and training courses, ELT, TFL, Train the Trainer, as well as international examinations such as TKT Core, TKT, CLI, LFCE, 
He is currently teaching adults and teenagers in a prestigious institute based in the USA. Michael regularly conducts training online via webinars and also helps educators embrace technology in their lessons. He's gonna present the following topic, doing communicative approach online, learning outcomes. What will we learn that day? Two things. Thing number one, by the end of the session, teachers will be able to incorporate communicative activities in an online lesson. And the second aspect, by the end of the session, teachers will be able to acquire and internalize different features of the com communicative approach. Yes, and don't forget the day. <laughs> Saturday, August yes. 28, next Saturday. At yeah, yes. But we, we are using the same. We are using the same time, like today, right? Not the same time. It's not the same time. And so it's gonna be different. So it's gonna be. It's that. gonna start at six. Yeah. Okay. At six o'clock the next weekend, the next Saturday, dear teachers. Now we are going to share the exit ticket for you. So, ahora compartimos con todos ustedes el exit ticket. Lo voy a hacer en español para que no haya ninguna duda. Pedirles siempre la paciencia, por favor, necesaria eh, para, para que podamos compartirles el exit ticket en el debido momento sin interrumpir la exposición del ponente. El día de hoy ha estado muy, muy interesante. Sé que todos hemos aprendido mucho, incluso de las preguntas y las respuestas a diferentes situaciones que se dan en nuestra experiencia en aula. El exit ticket, recuerden, es de mucha utilidad porque ustedes aquí van a llenar el formulario de registro de su asistencia con sus datos que deben ir correctos porque son los que van a aparecer en su constancia de participación. Eh, y de igual manera eh, es, son sus datos como su correo electrónico los que vamos a utilizar para poder enviarles el material que nos facilita el ponente de cada presentación. Por supuesto, ahí sabemos van a poder tener mayores detalles sobre los cursos que eh, Mr. Manuel Salas está dictando, muy interesantes, por cierto, felices de tenerlo aquí el día de hoy, un ponente con su calidad profesional. El exit ticket es el siguiente, si me ayudan los administradores, Administradores, por favor, a colocarlo en el chat de Facebook. Recuerden que no podemos compartirlo por WhatsApp porque solo es para la audiencia que está presente en este momento en la transmisión en vivo. Eh, solamente en el chat de Facebook, por favor, en los comentarios, fíjenlo, HTTPS, dos puntos, eh, doble slash, c u -t 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 punto, li, l -i slash, e -tip, que son las siglas de nuestra, de nuestra comunidad, English Teachers in Perú. Recuerden que la I va en minúscula. Es importante que respeten las mayúsculas y minúsculas de toda esta última parte, después del último slash, e tip y todo va en mayúscula. I, E, L, T, T, que son las siglas de este, eh, de este ciclo de, de webinars. I-E-L-T-T, -T, no? Intensive English Language Teacher Training. First, uno ST en minúscula, ¿sí? También les recordamos que um, the recording from this session will be available on our YouTube channel. Para quienes deseamos revisar una vez más, otra vez, sobre todo para nuestros excelentes docentes que forman parte de nuestro grupo de estudio para contrato, nombramiento, ascenso, eh, que es un servicio que estamos dando completamente gratuito, como todo este ciclo de webinars que no sería posible sin la ayuda de excelentes ponentes que tienen la bondad de aceptar nuestra invitación, como el día de hoy lo ha hecho Mr. Manuel Salas. Bien, aquí pueden encontrar todos nuestros webinars grabados. Ahí tienen también el link en YouTube, ¿ok? YouTube.com slash English Teachers in Perú. Facilísimo, ¿sí? Bien, ahora sí, 
como siempre, el agradecimiento inmenso a todo el genial equipo administrativo de la comunidad English Teachers in Perú, que hace posible este tipo de eventos, este ciclo de webinars, con el único fin, el único propósito de apoyar a todos los maestros en su formación docente, sin ningún interés particular, solamente eh, con la esencia que tiene nuestra comunidad de fortalecer la calidad educativa en nuestra área, inglés, y poder apoyarnos entre todos nosotros, porque juntos aprendemos más y estamos aprendiendo de los mejores. Bien, acá tienen el excelente equipo administrativo, lo voy a mencionar por ser el primer webinar para que los conozcan, seguro que muchos ya los conocen también por nuestro Facebook, por nuestro WhatsApp, nuestros administradores están en todo lado apoyando a los teachers, eh, Miss Ángela Salazar eh, from Arequipa, David Cuadros from Ayacucho, Sulamita Chuten from Cajamarca, Miss Oshin Flores from Camaná, Catherine Novoa from Chiclayo, Diana Chaploc from Chiclayo, Pamela Salazar from Chiclayo, Nefti Fortes from España, Kurt Vilela from Huancayo, Miriam Córdoba from Huancayo too, Maite Flores from Huacho, Evelyn Pita from Iquitos, Mayra Dre Ríos Rangifo from Lima, eh, Julia Millones from Lima, Daisy Apolinario, Antiulisa de la Cruz, and Gabriel Bayona from Lima, Lilia Espinosa from Lima, José Ortega from Puno, eh, Tabita Anaya, nuestra querida administradora que siempre va a permanecer en nuestro corazón toda la vida, aunque este año ingratamente nos, nos ha dejado, eh, from San Martín, and Kevin Laura from Tacna. Bien, ahora sí podemos encender las camaritas, todos por favor, para la despedida de nuestra comunidad English Teachers in Perú. Gracias, Angelita, los demás administradores. Ya nos hemos terminado de peinar todos, sí, ¿no? <risa> Vamos entonces a activar las cámaras. Hemos iniciado con broche de oro, con un excelente profesional el día de hoy. Eh, querido Manuel, te comento, seguro lo has visto, más de 700 participantes en el webinar de hoy día, desde México, Panamá, Ecuador, República Dominicana, eh, se me va por ahí Argentina, algunos otros países más, y por supuesto nuestros queridísimos colegas peruanos han estado prendidos, atentos de este excelente webinar. No me queda más de parte de todos los administradores aquí presentes, de parte de toda la comunidad eh, y de parte de todos los miembros de English Teachers in Perú, darte el agradecimiento eterno por haber aceptado esta invitación y por todo lo compartido el día de hoy. Estimado Manuel, escuchamos tus palabras. Bien, eh, para mí siempre será un, un placer poder ayudarles. Eh, siempre he colaborado con, con todas las, las instituciones y grupos de, de apoyo, asociaciones que, que tienen que, que ver con la enseñanza del, del idioma inglés para realmente poder eh, darles algunas luces, algunos alcances ¿no? desde nuestras experiencias y poder eh, ayudarles a, a mejorar. ¿no? Mejorar, todos queremos mejorar, todos aprendemos cada día algo más. Ayer aprendí algo muy interesante y hoy día espero aprender algo más. Mientras este, esté por ahí leyendo, siempre hay algo que leer, algo que ver, algo nuevo que aprender cada día. Así que esa es nuestra tarea, nuestra tarea diaria. ¿Mm? ¿Okay? Así que nada, cuando quieran, aquí estoy. Muchísimas gracias, Manuel. Por si acaso la sesión ha quedado grabada, te vamos a tomar la palabra en una nueva oportunidad. Por supuesto, vamos a estar encantados de volverte a tener. Sí, Nosotros felices de poderte tener con, con la comunidad y de compartir todo ese conocimiento que tienes en ti, que nos fortalece tanto. Créeme que este apoyo es, ha sido bastante solicitado por los maestros que en pocos sí, meses, en octubre, están dando un examen también en Perú, seguramente que en otros países sí. también lo dan para nombrarse, para contrato, para ascender. Y este tipo de topics, de temáticas, bueno, es un must ahí, son parte de, y realmente eh, sí. sé que todos ellos, y a nombre de ellos, el agradecimiento profundo hacia tu persona. De nada, de nada, estoy para servirles. 
Gracias, muchas gracias, Manuel. Bien, ahora sí, aunque sea una palabrita, teachers, eh, tienen que abrir los micros para que nos despidamos con ustedes. Nos despedimos el día de hoy, Miss Ángela Salazar. Hasta la próxima semana, teachers. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Siempre es un placer estar con ustedes. Muchas gracias por todo su apoyo, por estar siempre con nosotros. Y nos vemos pronto. <risa> Very good. Okay. Uh, ahora nuestro administrador Kurt J. Vilela Matos. Thank you, Mr. Manuel Salas, for your time. We have learned a lot today. Um, I hope we can see you, we can meet next weekend. Okay, okay, sure, sure. And, 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 and I hope we, we can meet in person sometime in the future. <laughs> yeah. okay, of, of course. course i haven't i haven't traveled for well for two years and i, I always travel i always travel i i know i mean many cities in peru except those in the rainforest but oh. uh, i love arequipa i love huancayo Tacna, puno also yes <laughs> of course i've been to puno mm, yes Thank you, Manuel. Okay. So now, nuestra administradora Sulamita Chukden. Gracias, gracias a todos por acompañarnos en nuestro primer webinar eh, de este ciclo. Y muchas gracias, Mr. Manuel Salas, por esa excelente presentación. Y les invitamos a todos que nos sigan acompañando eh, los sábados en los otros webinars que queda, que vamos a tener temas muy interesantes y con grandes, eh, amazing speakers. Muchas gracias, Miss Zuli. Miss Maite Flores. Thank you, Miss Muchas, muchas gracias, eh, Dier Manuel Salas, por esta oportunidad, no solo a nosotros, sino a todas las personas que te han escuchado eh, dentro de lo que es eh, el Perú y fuera también de mm de nuestras fronteras, entonces eh, queda también ese compromiso de seguir con los demás webinars y que nos acompañen a todos ustedes, teacher, en las próximas ediciones. Thank you. Ok, thank you, Miss Maite. Ahora Miss Miriam Córdoba Soto, nuestra administradora. Sí, buenas noches a todos. Una vez más agradecerles a cada una, a la audiencia, a los profesores que di, cada semana nos acompañan y también agradecer por la espléndida, eh, el topic que nos ha brindado Mr. Manuel Salas, invitarle y quedamos comprometidos con él para invitarlo en otra oportunidad porque en realidad ha estado muy interesante el tema. Sí, ya está más que comprometido nuestro querido Manuel. Y ha quedado grabado. <risa> Ahora sí continuamos. Miss Mayra Drey Ríos. Buenas noches, colegas. Eh, Buenas muchas noches, gracias, ¿no? Mr. Manuel, por su excelente presentación. Y bueno, esperamos que los demás English Teachers en Perú se conecten el próximo sábado, que el tema que se viene va a estar muy interesante. Yes, of course. Y Miss Lidia Espinosa, Miss Lidia, ¿podemos ahorita conectarnos o de repente podemos activar el audio? Miss Lidia, creo que está, debe estar. Sí. Ah, sí, está ahí. Ah, sí está, sí está. Pensé que se había ido a comprar pan. <risa> Posiblemente, es una posibilidad por la hora. Thank you so much, teacher, for this excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it was wonderful, your presentation. And thank, thank you. To all, all the teachers that can see through the Facebook community. Thank you, everybody. Gracias, Miss Lilia. Y por supuesto, quien está pendiente de toda la transmisión, teacher José Ortega. Muchísimas gracias por todo el apoyo. A todos, teachers, a toda la comunidad. Querido Manuel, time to say goodbye. Okay. Bye, goodbye, bye, everybody. Teachers. You're a wonderful team. Wonderful Thank team. you so much. <laughs> bye bye.